Um, Darla, Darla Jackson, thank you again for doing this. Um, Darla is a sculptor living in Philadelphia. She received a BFA in sculpture from Moore College of Art in 2003. And then after receiving a John S. and James L. Knight Arts Challenge Grant in 2011 and 13, she founded the Philadelphia Sculpture Gym, which was a member-based community sculpture studio. And the first place I met Darla, actually, because yeah. we had a student at the time who was doing an internship mm -hmm. uh, at the Philadelphia Sculpture Gym. So, wow, it's been a while. Her work, <laughs> her work has been shown in numerous exhibitions locally, including galleries and museums such as the Philadelphia Art Alliance, Seraphin Gallery, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the Woodmere Art Museum, and the Wind Challenge Exhibition at Fleischer Art Memorial. And she's shown across the country at galleries such as Think Space Gallery in Culver City, California, the Delaware Center for Contemporary Arts in Wilmington, and Parlor Gallery in Asbury Park, New Jersey. She's shown internationally in Belgium and Germany, and she's lectured about her work at venues, including the Barnes Foundation. She's currently teaching at PAFA. Um, she's teaching animal sculpture at Fleischer Art Memorial, and has been teaching mixed media sculpture, sculpture at Stockton University. Thanks, Darla. Thanks, thank you guys for coming. Um, come. <laughs> So um, I'll show you around. Um, the way that um, I'm set up here is Paul and I had moved to a new house last year, right around this time. And um, we're working on setting it up and getting everything in order. So there's a few rooms that are still um, designated more messy rooms and we were able to set up studios in them. Um, I will eventually move out to the garage because I have a big space out there. But um, for now I am in a room on the second floor and it's really great because it's filled with light and I love, I love working here. So I will take a moment to show you guys around the room and then I will um, talk about my setup and what I've been doing here. Um, so right behind me is a desk that I've been working at. Um, I have a few pieces going in progress here. So everything I've been doing has been small scale right now. Um, I was very excited for all of us to come back from spring break and see the bear that I dropped off on the third floor at Papa and then quarantine. So hopefully we'll all see it sooner rather than later. Um, I'm going to take my phone off the thing so I can show you. Um, so let me flip this around. Oops. All right. <laughs> so here are two pieces that I'm working on for upcoming shows. Um, this is for an exhibition at um, Arch Enemy Arts in Old City. Some of you guys had seen Paul and I show there in the fall of last year. And then I got asked to do a solo show on short notice at Antler Gallery in Portland, Oregon. So I started quickly working on things for that. Um, everything I've been doing here is smaller and using water-based clay. And so I'm able to do it at a desk really easily. Um, I have all my handy tools here um, that many of you have seen me use in classes. And then I've just been working on boards on one of these little Ikea um, turntables. And so for those of you working at home, especially if you're doing clay work, this setup is pretty nice just because it's super easy. Um, I have all my other tools at the ready, and then I'll give you the, the full scope here of how it's set up. I put those lights there so when I'm working at night, I have good lighting, um, but during the day, you can see that the light is pretty great in here. Um, I'm gonna walk you over this way. Um, so I have some things set up to show you guys to talk a little bit about mold making um, and the casting process. Obviously, it's going to be just a Martha Stewart style. I put the cake in the oven and oh, here it's done, magic. Um, but for anybody who's interested, I have a lot of information on my Instagram page under highlighted stories, and that's at Darla Jackson Sculpture on Instagram. And you can see the step by step process. I try to make it funny, I try to make it fun. Um, so, what happens here is you'll see this piece is a sculpture that I've coated in silicone rubber. Um, and 
what happens is you start with the clay sculpture like you saw, the bird or um, the rabbit over there. And then what I'll do with some molds is I'll paint layers of rubber. So this is a brush on mold where I'm actually brushing layers of rubber on a piece one at a time. And that builds up a thickness and makes it so that I can reproduce it. So I'm not usually firing my work as is traditional in ceramics. I'm reproducing it and casting it in plaster, um, which is a process I really enjoy despite it being like a labor of love. Um, and so then you'll see here is another step in that process where I've taken this piece, um, the rubber mold and also a brush on mold and made a mother mold around it which is just a plaster mold that keeps that rubber stiff because you can see that it's quite flexible and it wouldn't hold its shape on its own. So this provides the um, support that that rubber needs and creates a hollow cavity that I can cast into. Um, so these are both brush on style molds, which take a little bit more time. I know I've talked to some people at the Academy about that style of mold. Um, one of the easiest molds to understand, I think, is the block mold, and I have a, a small example here. So I made a piece that I sculpted in clay, um, and this is the dried out original, and what I did was poured rubber around it. So I built a small wall around this piece and then filled a container with rubber. So then I got a direct impression of that piece exactly. And what happens, the way that I end up reproducing is I'll make a batch of plaster and pour it into an empty mold, something like this or this, um, or this one up here. And once the plaster is set, I'll pull it out and it will be an exact replica of what I made in the first place. And so now that I have a rubber mold, I can reproduce you know, this 100 times if I want, you know, 100,000 if I want, if I take care of the mold. And so you can see that this is another block mold where it's just a solid block of rubber that's been poured around a form. And then a third, this one's a little different just because I made a bit of a support piece back there so I could do a thinner rubber. You can see how thin this one is in comparison to how thick this one is. Silicone rubber, which this is, tends to be expensive. Um, so whenever you can save money, it's helpful. Um, so here's another example of a piece that is cast. And so I've reproduced this piece and the one here below it probably upwards of 75 times each at this point. Um, so if you're doing something, especially at a small scale like this where the casting process is really easy, a block mold is a wonderful way to go if you have a piece that's pretty open in the back. Um, there is another third version of rubber mold making, and uh, this is called a blanket mold. So I'm going to flip this over so you can see. Here's that negative space, similar to with these other ones, but the difference here is that rather than brushing on the rubber, and this is hard to do with one hand, mm -hmm, I will make a clay blanket that's shaped exactly like this rubber is now and put it over the piece. Um, this is a little more abstract to try and understand uh, just by the, the Martha Stewart method, as I said, but um, like I said, if you go to my Instagram, you can see the step-by-step -step process. I think it's 88 steps in there to get to this point, but um, it's, a, it's pretty fun along the way. And so the plaster gets built up around this clay wall the clay wall will then get removed and this piece goes over the original sculpture and rubber gets poured into these holes until it fills up and sets. And then later on, you have another version of a rubber mold for your pieces. This piece works well for certain types of pieces, um, smaller pieces that are open or low to a board or they work really nicely with this. Um, as I always tell you guys, anybody who's ever making molds, if you have any questions about how to do it or how to um, determine which type of mold, I'm always happy to talk about it because the difference between these two molds is usually there's a lot more um, time and material involved in this. 
Um, this is more time than it is material, and a block mold is more material and very little time. So sometimes it depends on how much material you have, and sometimes it depends on how much time you have. I also laid out some things over here so you can see some examples of what pieces look like when they come out. Um, so like I showed you this one here, you'll see that it has a bit of flashing on the edge there. So I would use um, some tools to clean that up as I am getting it ready to be finished. Here are some other plaster pieces that are out of molds that haven't had much done to them, just a little bit of cleanup. I think there's yeah, a slight seam line that needs a little more work here. Um, and then over here are some finished pieces. Now the thing here that I wanted to show you guys is that, um, like I said earlier, very rarely do I fire my work, like as in traditional ceramics. However, there are two pieces here that I did um, fire. So these both are clay originals. I don't have a mold, and so I'm not able to make reproductions of them unless I make a mold off of these fired pieces. Um, whereas these pieces, if you look, these three birds are exactly the same. The only thing that's different about them is uh, the feet, which I sculpted individually using a product called Magic Sculpt, um, which anybody who's had me in class, I'm sure I've talked about and swear by. Um, here's another example of a piece that I used the same piece from the same mold and just inverted it. And then this piece actually is one piece using the two of them together. Um, so, the reason that mold making is so nice is because you're able to reproduce things in a way and do different things with them or have additions like you would in printmaking. Um, here is another piece that has had multiple variations of it. I first made this for a show in Arch Enemy Arts, but then it was done in another finish and used as part of an album um, cover for a band called Anguish. And then this was a third edition that was also used as part of that album artwork. And also, no Darla Jackson studio tour would be complete without a rabbit somewhere. Um, so then what I'll do is I'll show you guys over here. Um, I have a clay piece in progress. And then this is sort of my studio stash of supplies. So I have casting resins, my scales, my buckets, um, my pins and all of the mold releases and things down there on the bottom. I'm typically working with Polytech products, but um, some smooth on products as well. And I'm always happy to give you guys product recommendations because sometimes that makes a big difference. Um, more supplies here. Magic Sculpt is that resin that I was talking to you guys about. For anybody who's working with Sculpey, um, which is another polymer, this stuff is ages beyond that because Sculpey will break and crumble over time and it's not a fine art material whereas Magic Sculpt is an epoxy resin it's very strong and it will last a very very long time so any of you are interested in sculpting directly this stuff is great it's very strong you can get it online I use a website called Kitcraft K-I-T-K-R-A-F-T um, to get it and it's great they're great to work with Here's sort of the um, sculpture hospital and or in progress and or reject pile. Um, so these are things that are either broken, in progress, or I'm just sort of sitting on to see what happens with. And then also molds in various states of being cleaned out um, and whatnot. And then an area for castings and a few pieces up there that are sort of waiting. Um, and I'll come back over here. I'm gonna flip it around again. I'm gonna try to flip it around again. There we go. Um, to do. Oh, hang on. I lost you guys. Zoom. I'm a Luddite, so forgive my technical difficulties. Okay, there we are. <clears throat> so I saw that some of you guys jumped in um, while I was doing the around the way tour. Um, does anybody have any questions about mold making process or um, anything having to do with 
um, sculpture, anything, happy to answer at this moment. What kind of class are you in? Hi, Dave Hesh, how are you? Um, so um, one thing that is, um, I guess, I prefer to use hydrocal in terms of plaster just because it's a stronger, more industrial strength plaster. Hi, Dave. Um, so I get that from a ceramic supplier, which is, um, I get it from the ceramic shop. I'm actually not sure who uh, John gets the plaster from, but it may be those guys as well. Hydrocal is one of those plasters that strangely disappears for like months at a time. They run out of it and it's hard to get. So in that case, I will switch over to either Ultracal or um, uh, FGR95 works too. Um, and so those things are good to cast with. Then the, um, the thing I use to make molds with is just a regular molding plaster or pottery plaster. Those are the cheaper of the plasters as well. Uh, so it's, it's better to use for mold making. I saw another question, but then I lost it because, uh... hi Anne, I see you there. <laughs> Let's see, where's the chat? There it is. Okay, as a creative, what is my daily or uh, weekly work routine like? Hi Kyle. Um, so my routine is, oh, why did I disappear? Sorry guys. Um, there, baby, there I am again. Um, my routine has been not very different from normal. So I teach Monday and Wednesday right now. Um, Fleischer where I teach on Tuesdays is currently closed. So I've been using Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays to make work. Um, Sundays I usually hang out with Olivia um, and Paul and so we, we spend time doing that but um, I, I wake up in the morning and I get her set for school because she's doing school from home and then I get myself set up either for my day upstairs sculpting or teaching. Um, fun fact, I love to do Sudoku puzzles and I do one every day while I drink my coffee. And then um, I usually come up here and work for a few hours. And then when Olivia has lunch, I go sit down with her and then um, come back up after. I try, you know, like anyone in a creative field, it's, it's a job. And so despite whether people treat it that way um, it is and so I always I always treat it like that I do take some time out of every day to make sure I'm posting things on Instagram and um, looking into there's a lot of resources right now for online learning and online teaching and um, also a lot of things for grants that artists can get as well and so if you're interested in looking into this there's a huge list of them right now anybody's interested I'm happy to share them um, the city of Philadelphia just released a grant that's $500 for every artist and so things like that are, are, are great to look into. So I take a little bit of time every day for the business end of things. Um, next up is to revamp my website. I've been working also with my foundations class on our binders for you know, promoting our work that are existing in both a digital and physical space and so I'm working on images of my artwork and revamping those a little bit, um, which is always good to do well from the beginning so you don't have to reshoot everything later. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I see Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hey, darling. <laughs> I have a question for you about yeah. um, resins. That, that giant bear sculpture that you have, yeah. um, that's in resin, right? If yes. I remember correctly. Um, I just have a question about how you go about painting resin mm -hmm. um, because I've had some struggles where like the paint kept chipping off. I, I cleaned it with alcohol. Uh, maybe I did like a, a layer of gesso and then oil painted on top, but kept kind of cracking. Um, what do you use? <laughs> so the top secret trick, which they should just write on the boxes. So um, if you're making a mold, if you're using silicone rubber, which you usually do, um, you can just spray paint primer right into the mold before you put resin in it. And it will stick to the silicone until you cast it and then it will come off on the resin. Mm -hmm. And so you can use any like auto body primer. They have gray, they have white. So depending on what you're going to paint it like later. Um, that is the best way to go about it because then it comes out clean and ready to go. 
Um, if not, then I'll usually use denatured alcohol, um, but it's still sometimes like if there's any mold release or anything on it, it can repel the paint, which is really annoying. In that case, I'll give it a light sand all over the place um, to try and avoid doing too much to the surface. Usually that solves the problem. If that's not working, it could be a matter of your mixture. Sometimes with resins, what happens is if you use just a little bit too much of one side, it will mess the mix up so that it repels finishes that you put on it. So the stuff like from Polytech and Smooth on that stuff's pretty foolproof, but doesn't mean that it doesn't not work sometimes because it feels like no good reason. If you have, <laughs> thank you. If you have um, like a hole in your past or like the alignment wasn't right and you have to sculpt something in resin, what kind of, um, like what do you use to fix that? So usually I'll use the magic sculpt, the resin, the epoxy resin that I showed you guys. Um, the reason I don't go with the regular resin that it was cast with is just that stuff's a little harder to work with. It's a little more unpredictable. It's easier to cast with and to paint in. However, with, um, with the epoxy resin, you just mix up a batch of it and then you just blend it in. And that stuff is blendable with water, so it works really well with the resin, which is no, not and then bad. you have to paint over it, right? Because it doesn't, like, it's, there's no color or it's white. Yeah, so usually I will sand it just a little bit and then prime the whole thing so it's consistent um, mm -hmm. because I've tried to paint over things in the past and have it, it's, it doesn't breed correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and then as far as back to the bear, when I did that, I spray painted in a black primer when I was casting it. Um, and then I painted it in a layer at a time. I think it's three layers and then put all the pieces together. And that piece is actually um, filled with polyurethane uh, foam, polyurethane expanding foam. And so it's a two part foam from Polytech. It's R8, so it's hard. Um, so it's not like, for those of you who have never used expanding foam before, you can get it so it's like squishy like a Nerf ball or you can get it so it's hard like, um, I don't like hard foam. <laughs> so, whatever is made out of that besides big bears. Um, the fun fact about the big bear is that the very first one I made was hollow and I could pick it up over my arm by myself. Um, and someone put it in a window and because that resin doesn't hold up to heat very well and it was such a thin casting, uh, they put it in a window that got very hot and it melted its head sort of down a little bit. It didn't melt completely, but it just, it changed it. So I knew when I had to cast it again that I had to make it so that it was full of foam otherwise. Which resin was that that melted? It was the same one, 1512X from Polytech, which I love, but it has to be reinforced if it's a big, heavy thing. So, yeah, and anybody who's interested in all these materials, I'm happy. I can even make a list of like, these are the things I use and this is where you get them. A lot of these companies have um, kits that are available, especially if you're a student, they'll give you student pricing or first time buyer pricing. And what you can do is um, try smaller kits of different things and see what you like. And um, the workarounds, yeah, Dave, I'll definitely make sure I give that to everybody. Um, the workaround with Polytech is I know that it's not just the first time you order from them ever, it's the first time you order any product. So if you try 1512X one time, you say, I want to try 1512, no X, let's do that. Or, um, you know, the, the rubber, you can order different types of rubber and get the discount, the first time buyer discount. You just have to call and ask them, but they're usually um, really great to talk to on the phone. I've never had any problems with them. So, any questions about, I don't know, anything else sculpture related? I have a question for you. Um, let me put my face back on. Um, okay. Hi, so, Cindy. hi. So since you graduated from Moore, um, did you teach yourself all these techniques or did you do internships with people or how did you get into to doing all this? So I made my first mold. Um, I did figure sculpture a bit when I was there, but they weren't focused on it very much at all. 
Um, so I had done um, a 12 inch figure like we did in my class. Um, well, you weren't in my sculpture class, but at, like we do in my sculpture class, a small full figure. Mm -hmm. um, and I made a waist mold of that. And then I said, I want to do a big one. So I did a life size figure and I made a plaster waist mold of that, um, which was you know, trial by fire, but it went great. They still have the piece at more, which is hysterical. Um, but I knew I wanted to learn different types of materials because I didn't want to just limit myself to casting only one piece in plaster only. So I, I uh, worked with someone to learn how to do rubber molds. And I did it starting on a small scale first. I did pieces that were like this big, made rubber molds of them and enjoyed it. And so then I went to doing a life-size self-portrait of a kneeling, a kneeling version and made a rubber mold of that. So that was my first large scale rubber mold, which mm -hmm. I did while still in school. Um, and then after I graduated, I knew I wanted to learn more about all the potential materials. And I ended up getting a great job. Like it was Darla Jackson's perfect out of school job at this place called Kitchen Sink Fabrication, where I was able to make um, sheep and goats and we made um, I made a model of a baby chick that was this big but it got blown up to be 16 feet tall wow. if you go to the state museum in Harrisburg there's a kids display and it's still there mm. um, so we did all these barnyard animals in various materials but I learned how to use silicone rubber which is way more temperamental than polyurethane rubber is um, and that's another thing that I'm always happy to talk about the differences between polyurethane rubber and silicone rubber. The silicone rubber that I use, the hot pink stuff, is Rebound 25 from Smooth On. That's great. It's mm. expensive, but it's good. Mm. Um, but so then I got to learn about the, the differences between all these materials. So casting in resin, doing some fiberglass, um, learned that I hate fiberglass. It's awful. Um, and it's terrible for you. <laughs> and so it was great to work with a bunch of different types of resins um, and casting materials and rubbers and casting in rubber and using foam and just being able to experiment with these pieces in a setting where I was being taught sort of as I went. Um, I was also very active about seeking out people that were doing processes that I was interested in and made sure to connect with them and offer to help them in the studio or um, just if they needed somebody to hold something while they were doing and if they didn't mind explaining as they were going along the way. So um, that worked out really well. And then just continuing to learn, like I watch YouTube videos of Polytech stuff. I've had them come out to um, the sculpture gym when I had that to do demos and casting in different materials. And so they have a ton of resources, which are great. It's just, it's always better to see this stuff, especially if you're doing it for the first time or to have somebody there because it can be traumatic <laughs> if you don't get it right and expensive if you don't get it right. Do you have to wear like um, um, a respirator when you use that stuff, the Polytech or? Yeah. Yeah. So I err on the side of safety and I, I do, some of the things are not as like polyurethane, Rubber is way more um, noxious than uh, silicone rubber is, but it's, um, I try to be just very safe because I care about my lungs and, and whatnot. I wear gloves all the time and I'm so used to having a respirator on my face. And so that's what's interesting about all this is, you know, none of this new normal, I hate that term, but um, is any different for me because I just pretend everything has sculpture materials on it rather than coronavirus. <laughs> so that, that's been helpful <laughs> in that way. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I think that, um, yeah, I think that trying to, to just look at all the resources, Instagram has been one of those places too, that's a really great resource for people um, in terms of materials. My cat is on the art. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of people sharing a lot of information there and it's hard to see what people are doing right and what people are doing wrong always but sometimes you will learn something like even I follow a mold making hashtag and learn something new periodically which is really awesome um, and I think it's nice community wise that people are able to share the information yeah, for sure thank you yeah my pleasure um all right let's 
take a moment to, because I think Algary would be proud if I showed my cats. That is spooky stuff. He loves art, <laughs> loves sitting on art. Um, oh, yay. <laughs> Hi, hi, Teacher Victoria. Um, I like to see everybody's comments. Cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you guys downstairs because I do have a room downstairs that I have some of my um, inspiration pieces in and some more of my work. I'm taking you right now through Paul's studio. This is his painting setup. And this is kind of like a house tour as well. I'll turn it back five please. So this is um a room that I've been setting up sort of as a an in-house gallery. So if you look around, you can see like this is a piece of Paul's a painting that he did many years ago. And that's a picture of my great great grandmother. Um this is a lithograph that Paul did. Um at Fleischer, a uh, stone litho that he did with Peter, who's one of the master printers there. He's pretty great. Um, this case is a case that we got from the Mütter Museum and I'm using it to show my work here, which is really fun. Um, this piece is actually dual sided, so you can flip it upside down and show it so that the wolf's head is upside down because there's things inside. Um, oh, and this is a, a project I did with my foundations class where we made books out of unconventional objects. Those are magnolia petals that have been since dried. And this is, this is pancakes, the cat. And um, this is a series that I did in January where I sculpted one piece every day. And these were actually all fired clay. Um, which I said is atypical for me, but I wanted to make sure that um, I was keeping them all over pieces. So here is an older piece, uh, a peacock. You can see it's got a bit of damage there, um, but I will fix it. And then that's the head of the lioness. So anybody who saw the postcards for this show might recognize the fact that it was sculpted in this room. So Paul and I had a table set up here that was four foot by eight foot and sculpted it using clay um, that we borrowed from Shane and Julia Stratton, Kafa alumni. Um, and this is where I am today when I'm reaching my foundation. And these are some of the cabinets that we have of objects that we're using in our work as reference or just as inspiration. And come over here. Got this guy, turtle, and then another cabinet. Um, let me open up. This house was a doctor's office, not just before we moved in, but a long while ago. And so we had all these really great built-ins that we're able to make good use of. So and then this is Olivia doing her schoolwork and some more paintings. What? Olivia said you should follow her Instagram. It is Olivia's Drawlovin. That she didn't say it, but she mentioned it. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I'm happy to answer them, sculpture or weird collection related or otherwise. Um, hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good to see <laughs> yeah. you. A question for you on the magic sculpt. Um, that you said you would you use that for your birds, the black birds you showed us upstairs right, that you sculpt directly yeah. in it, if I understand you right. So, um, and the, let me just see, I wrote it down. You say it's an epoxy resin clay, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So um, what, so you, it's a clay, you sculpt in it, and then how do you cure it? How does this solidify? So I'll actually take it upstairs and show you the batch of it. But what happens is if 
a two-part sculptable resin. So what you do is you take two equal sized balls of it and you roll them together until the color's consistent. So what happens is the color usually will be two different colors, one for each of the, the sides. So let me get some out. So these are older batches, but you'll be able to see here that this one part is sort of a gray, a light gray, whereas this is a weirder, greener gray. Um, and they have different colors. There's white, which is a white, and this gray. Um, there is, um, actually, I'll show you how to mix it. So what I'll do when I'm sculpting with this is I will make a ball of one size, and then I will get some from the other. I'm getting much better at doing things one-handed because of all this. And so I want to make sure that they're relatively equal in size. This stuff is pretty non-fussy, like it can be a little off and you'll still be okay, but you want it to be pretty similar. And then you'll just mix it and see how you can still see differences in color, sorry, I'm gonna be too close, um, and marbling. And so you want to get it so that the color reads consistently throughout. And the thing about this stuff, if you are working with it directly, you can make an armature out of something like tin foil or foam and you can go right over top of it. And that is helpful because you don't have to use a lot of it so I'm going to bring it over here into the light. And you can see there's still a little bit of variation, so I'm going to mix it some more. But I'm going to pull in tight on these guys. So each of the bodies were cast in hydrocal, and then there was a small piece of armature wire put in each of the legs. I just drilled into the birds themselves and then used the sculpting epoxy over that. And so this is very easily moldable and then it sets on its own by mixing these two pieces together um, that will help catalyze the, the resin so you don't have to do anything you don't have to cook it you don't have to you just have to wait um, and so you have a little less than an hour depending on what the temperature is like before it starts to get too hard to work and then it will fully set within 24 hours usually 16 but um, I always try to let it sit for a full 24 to be safe. And then do you paint over that to get the black? So yeah, what I do is just because this tends to be pretty smooth once you've worked with it, I'll rough it up with a little bit of sandpaper and then I'll go over it. I'm usually painting these with black gesso, which takes to this really well. If you were putting something else over it, you could always just spray it with a primer, um, any sort of auto body spray paint primer would work really well. Mm -hmm. But it's good for little details like feet and things that would otherwise break. Um, these would never come out of this mold in one piece. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would always make sure that I'm sculpting little fragile things like that in, in a resin. So it's not like the entire piece is made out of that material. It's just, you just use it for very specific. Yeah, just the feet. I have done pieces where the whole thing was, um, where the whole thing was made out of tin foil and I went over it. Sounds bad to have it be tin foil, but it's inexpensive. <laughs> it's a good armature when you're using this material. And then I would just make a thin layer of this and skim coat it over the top and then build up from there because then what happens is you can use much less of it and you're not, you're not going to, um, you're not going to waste your money, <laughs> essentially. Do you need the tin foil inside or do you eventually kind of get it out of there? Like What's that? If you had a tin foil um, armature, would you scrape it out and get it out? Of I would just leave it because it ends up being the support inside. Tin foil is sort of just the easiest thing. The other thing I like to use is um, foam, like the pink foam from Home Depot. That works really well. If you have a carvable foam, carvable foam works really great. Um, anything like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Yeah. 
And then I saw somebody asked a question, but I always, there it is. Um, Claudia asked if I, books or films that I've been into lately and have been formative in my work or inspiration. Um, yes. So, um, I don't know. Usually I feel like everything I enjoy is pretty bleak. So like one of my favorite movies is Children of Men, which is, feels very apocalyptic. Um, but right now that it feels more like that in real life, <laughs> I've been having a harder time watching things like that. Um, so I've been leaning more toward books and um, people like Angela Carter, her sort of versions of fairy tales are very inspirational for me. Um, reading a lot of Brian Evenson right now. His stories are pretty bleak as well, but I enjoy them. Um, I'm also reading two books by, or have read, but rereading with Olivia, two books by Aaron Morgenstern, um, The Night Circus and The Starless Sea. Those two are beautiful books and they're, they're really beautifully written and there's a lot of imagery in there that I respond to really well. Um, and it was great because I got very excited when I read the first book and I wrote her a nice message and sort of fangirled at her and she said, oh yes, I bought some of your work in 2005. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Um, and then she just got another piece and uh, we were able to send her a, a package full of work and a story from Olivia. So that was, that was exciting as well. Um, that, and I think just Instagram has been really nice lately and I hate that. Um, because I try to stay off devices as much as possible, but I think it's a really great tool to be able to connect with people and see work and inspirations um, that other people have. And it's, it makes it really easy and accessible uh, to see what people are looking at, what they're doing, and then make connections. Um, Cindy asks, what kind of paint do I use to paint my pieces, especially the resin? Oh, you're welcome, Claudia. Um, the resin pieces get painted. So my work, I always start with black gesso. Um, I love how flat it is and it takes the graphite that I rub on really well. Um, so that's the next part for me is to take raw graphite powder and a big fluffy brush and just rub it on the surface. And with my work, if you ever see it in person, it has a metallic shine. It looks almost like iron. And I really enjoy that because ideally I would love to cast everything in iron, but iron is heavy and expensive and hard to do in a normal setting. Um, I've done it on a very small scale when we had the sculpture gym and loved it, but it's, you know, the, the, the scale I want to work at, um, casting in iron isn't always a practical thing to want, <laughs> want to do. So, um, so finishing, yeah, I, I usually stick with the the gesso, um, if I'm going to paint something more realistically, I'll usually finish it with either a spray primer in white or gray, and then go over top of it with acrylics in layers. If you go too heavy, too fast with acrylics, it never is going to look right. So you wanna do washes. Um, I, I think another person that does this really well is Steve Lane and Amy Kahn, because I think she does finishes on his work too. Um, it's just a very, really, nice washy layer one at a time um, dark to light and you can get surfaces that have nuance in them that is more easily controllable I think if you try to do it a layered time rather than if you're just going all for it at once and yeah oh you're welcome Cindy <clears throat> Yeah, and I'm gonna get ready to do um, the rabbit piece that I showed you guys a little earlier. It's a small piece. I think if not this week, then early next week, I'm gonna start a um, blanket mold or not a blanket mold, sorry, a brush on mold. And so I'll do a video of that and I'll post it on YouTube so that people can have access. I think the step-by-step -step process is great because it's a, a way to show people how things are done in an easy fashion, but I think things get left out in that way. So I wanted to start doing a series of videos so that people can see how, how in detail you need to be in terms of pushing rubber into crevices and how, how many air bubbles there are and, and what it looks like to properly mix a batch of rubber. Um, so I will be doing that and I'm happy to share a link to that as well. 
Um, and Greg, I still can't see the clock, so I don't know where we're at on time, but. We're just about ready to wrap up. Some people are going to be going to their one o'clock classes, so okay. it's, it, it's exactly 12.50. Oh. Um, so yeah, we can take probably one more question, but thank you so much for doing this. Oh yeah, it's my pleasure. I, I did it um, with Fleischer a few weeks ago, and it was, I was more nervous to do that than I was to teach. <laughs> ever <laughs> for some reason and um there was a hundred people that were signed on all at once so that was, it was fun and scary but um yeah it was it was good so this this has been good as well well and you have a beautiful house <gasps> thank you we're working on it it's um it's been slow and steady and uh we've been slowly painting the rooms wild and crazy colors we have that green room we have a, a hot pink room so busting out of like the all white walls everywhere and everything's crazy colors. Right. So should we take one more question if someone has a question? Otherwise, we'll sign off. Yeah, I'm happy to if, if anybody right. has one. <laughs> I really appreciate you doing this to tell you the truth it's, yeah I, I'm glad I got a chance to see how you work and you know because I know you're very productive and it's nice to hear how how you do it yeah. oh thank you thank you guys yeah I think for Carol, me oh. let's go ahead well, I was just gonna say if no one else has a question um I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about getting a Knight Foundation grant because that was like such a huge deal. It was a national yeah. grant competition um, and you got it two years. So could you talk a little bit about that? Happy to, yeah. So um, they came to Philadelphia and that was the first year they had their arts challenge grant. Um, so they were based in Florida previously doing their arts challenge work. And when they came to Philadelphia, I am, you know, it motivated, I guess you would say. And um, I knew that I wanted to apply to the grant and, um, thank you Chris, um, I wanted to apply just with something. And so Justin and I, um, my ex who is a Papa alum as well, he and I had talked about having a space and I had my own studio to that point, but um, there were things that I hadn't done since I was in art school because I didn't have access to them. So I hadn't welded since I was in school. I hadn't um, ever done any blacksmith work, which I'd wanted to. Um, and there were other things that I just never had access to, ceramics, um, jewelry making, thing, just random things that you wouldn't just go out and start on your own necessarily. So when they had the call for the grant, it was actually a very easy application process. Um, and the reason I think mine stood out is because I was an individual in a sea of organizations um, and so that it was a new idea that it didn't exist in that way yet in Philadelphia. Um, at the time there was Next Fab Studios but I think um, they were more way more tech focused than they are now. I think they have much more involvement in the arts at this point which I think is great but also um, it was it was something they were interested in supporting because it was for it, the direct community and for the arts. One of the problems that Dennis said, he was um, the VP of the Knight Foundation, that one of the biggest problems that they had is that people wouldn't read the grant description. And so they would apply for stuff um, that had nothing to do with what they were funding. And on the third year, they had me jury for the, the challenge as one of the, <laughs> the judges. And the first one I read was like, can you help fund my barbershop? And <laughs> I was like, what? This, this, this has nothing to do with what's, what's happening. So um, I think having a good, strong idea is always a key thing. Um, writing about it in a way that is clear and concise and to the point um, I try to always, when I'm applying for grants and things, is read the language that's in the application and say it back 
to them what I want to do in a similar language. Um, I think that for some reason that seems to work and um, it reiterates points that they're trying to make as well. Um, and so I was shortlisted as a finalist and then they asked for a longer questionnaire of descriptions of what you would do, how you would use the money, what the funding would go to, and I really just try to be very thorough about thinking, overthinking it. So what, what would this cost? What would this cost? What would this cost? And obviously the space didn't exist yet, so it was just all speculation on my part, but I try to just think of everything that I could and include it to a point of overdoing it. Um, a big thing that helped also was that I only asked for uh, $20,000 total. And that was like the very low, not the lowest amount, but one of the lowest amounts. I think other places were getting like $250,000 to $500,000. So $20,000 was a drop in the bucket for them, but it was huge for me. Um, and we were able to match that. So you had to do a matching, you had to raise $10,000, which I did through Kickstarter, um, which was great. And I think that one of the biggest things I learned that is that people want to support a good idea. They don't necessarily want to be in charge of it, but they want to support it if they hear it. So once I announced the Sculpture Gym, so many people came forward donating tools, donating money, um, donating just their services to help however they could, and that was amazing. And then I just tried to be very organized, and from the beginning tried to have a, even before the Sculpture Gym actually started, I was communicating with people about, this is our search for our building, this is our, you know, we found our building, this is us cleaning out all the tires and bird poop that were in the building, and so people followed along. And they really became attached to it as an idea because they were so um, they were so invested in it from the beginning, even just from a standpoint of watching. I feel that way similarly just about art making. Um, and that's another thing that social media allows us to do is people can see the whole journey of the piece. So by the time they see the finished piece, they're much more attached to it than they would be of just seeing, oh, here's this piece. There it is, it's done. And then they never see it again. Whereas if it's the build up, like, oh, here's my inspiration and here's how I started it. And this is, you know, what I was thinking about. And then they see it a few times along the way. It ends up being more meaningful to them, I think. And similarly with the building of the space. Um, and I think it was that in, you know, that I was an individual and that I had, you know, my press picture was a picture of me and a shark in party hats like a shark sculpture <laughs> pretty good um it was it made it fun for them to promote and i was so excited because it was such a life changer for me and i think just being vocal about that was helpful too i remember talking uh to peter crimmins whoy about it and how he's like You're, you seem so excited i'm like i am so excited um so just being that real person behind the grant not just Hi, I'm a professional organization and you know, I think that they knew me more closely was really helpful. Um, and then the second grant came because they saw that we were doing a good job and that we could use more funding to expand what we were doing. So the second grant ended up adding um, a blacksmith shop and a jewelry studio and a ceramic shop to the existing space, which had a wood shop, a metal shop, the gallery and then the classroom area so yeah and then just being consistent throughout like I think you know my marketing and branding and all that was um, I tried to be very consistent throughout that whole process and I think that that helped great thank you yeah you're welcome. um thanks for doing this people can reach you at um, they can find me on either Instagram at Darla Jackson Sculpture or by email, uh, Darla Jackson Sculpture at gmail.com or any of you who have my pop email already, that's fine too. And I'm happy to answer any mold making questions, sculpture related questions, anything like that. I know Kelly touches base every once in a while and she's got a <laughs> mold in progress. So um, I love stuff like that. Yes, thank you um, so much. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Um, Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Next week, Peter Van Dyke.
Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Appreciate Bye, it. Guys. Bye, Darla. Bye. Bye. Bye.